Hey everybody, welcome to Full Draw Friday number 21. This week we're going to be talking about keys to successful planning, and that's going to be for your food plots, whether you're doing spring or fall, or whether you're doing grains, or anything else, clovers, brassicas. I'll go over some keys that are going to make those successful, some things that I think you need to hit, no matter what you're planning, that's going to be really important. Uh, and if you miss any of them, it's probably going to be a good reason why your food plots failed. And then we'll also get into some switchgrass stuff, some tips for successful stands of switchgrass, because Jeff had a question on that a couple of weeks ago, and I apologize for not getting into that last week, but I try to keep these on a certain time limit, so since it is the shorter episode for the week. But that's what we're going to get into this week, guys, and then we'll be ready to, to head into the weekend. Let's get right into it here, the keys to successful planting. The first one I kind of mentioned on a previous episode when I was reading through an article by Dr. Kroll in North American Whitetail, and it's really three things wrapped up into one, and that's your soil, sunlight, and water. And obviously, as I said before, your soil and your sunlight are going to be two way more controllable aspects than the water. Now, there are some guys that will water their plots. We're looking into maybe being able to do some of that at some point. But for most people, soil and sun are the two things that you're going to be able to control. And what that entails is, first with the soil, doing a, a soil test, a soil sample of some sort. Like I've talked about before, Whitetail Institute has a really great one. At the very least, you need to do a pH test on your soil because if you don't have your pH right, then you're not going to grow anything anyway. So that'll give you an idea of how much lime you need to put down to get that where it needs to be. And that is a very solid starting point for your food plots. If you don't do that, if your soil's crap, then you're not going to grow anything anyway. So you've got to do a soil test no matter what you're planting. You might get away with it for a year or two, but eventually that stuff you're planting is going to rob the soil of what nutrients are there. It's not going to put that much back into it. You're going to lose organic matter, and you're going to have issues in years to come. So you have to do your soil test. At least every other year, I recommend, and especially in the first year if you're doing a new food plot, at the minimum, do a pH test. The second one is make sure that you're getting plenty of sunlight for whatever you're planting. So obviously there are different blends that have different needs for sunlight. Brassica blends often need more sunlight than a clover does. And a lot of times clover needs, most clover blends are going to need four hours of sunlight a day. That's why we recommend them more often for planting inside the woods things of that nature where you're you're not going to have as much sunlight to the ground. But what that means is if you don't have an open field and you do have to plant in the timber, you're probably going to have to cut some of your canopy out. And that means cutting down trees. Uh, it could mean cutting little stuff down that's shading them out too. And you can't just think about straight up because the sun's only there for a short period of time. You need to get some area on either side of your food plot to the east and west and even to the south really helps as well with getting sun on your food plot for more hours of the day. Because if you don't have the sunlight, you can have perfect soil and you can have a lot of rain and you're not going to have a good food plot. So you got to have all these three things combined and that's another one that you can control. Obviously, like I said, the water is harder to control because you can't do anything about Mother Nature when it comes to rain. The best thing you can do is try to plant with the weather. Try to plant before rain's coming. A 60% chance or better is, is usually ideal because we all know how accurate the weathermen are at times. And even like last year, we had some days where we were supposed to have that chance of rain and didn't end up having them. So you can do everything else perfect. If Mother Nature doesn't cooperate, you're just not going to have good food plots. But at the very least, you can do the first two things, control what you can control, and then let it play out from there. And there are opportunities to, to water your food plots, especially if you have a water source nearby, like where I've got at the cabin, there's ponds by both of those food plots. Um, this year, if we had the same issues as last year, probably going to have to go get a pump and put water on those food plots. I'm just going to have too much invested into them to let them go uh, over the rain. So if you have something closer, if you have a tank that you can put water in and go water those, that's always an option. But remember, it takes something like 27,000 gallons of water on an acre to equal an inch of rain. So even if you take a quarter acre of that, it's like 6,700 gallons to do an inch of rain on a quarter acre or a quarter inch of rain on a total acre or over a whole acre. So that's something to think about when it comes to watering them. That's why it's just easier and way more efficient 
to let Mother Nature do her thing and try to plant around the rain, not necessarily just based on the calendar. However, timing is big, and I'll get into that a little bit here towards the end of this. The next thing is your your seed bed preparation, and that's going to vary by the type of seed you're planting. Obviously, you need to have a better seed bed prepared for corn and beans, especially corn. You're not going to be able to run a no-till drill. If you're planting corn, you're going to want to have a good seed bed. You want to disc it or till it and get it all all good and pretty for that seed to go down because corn, um, you're going to want to have it at the same depth across in good spacing. So that's really important for that. Beans, the depth being consistent is not as important, but you still have to have it. If you don't have an O-till drill, again, you're going to have to do a lot more prep than you would, say, with clover or even brassica blends where you might be able to just go in and spray and broadcast those. Um, they don't need to be nearly as deep as the corn and beans do and don't have to have the soil coverage that they do. So you got to do your seed bed prep dependent on what kind of seed you're planting. And again, that could be tilled. It could just be spraying to get everything dead and out of the way, the weeds and the grasses, so you can have good seed to soil contact for your smaller seeds as well. And that leads into the next thing. The third key that I have is seed depth. And the biggest thing about that is you're going to want to read the labels on the package. If you're planting clover, and our brassicas, the worst thing you can do and the worst thing we see happen a lot is getting them too deep. What's going to happen then is they're not going to have enough energy to make it all the way through the soil. They're going to germinate, and then they're just going to die. They're never going to make it through the soil and get to the sunlight and grow. They're just going to die underneath of the soil. You're never going to see it. You're going to wonder what happened. It's probably because you planted it too deep. And that can be, for a clover, a half inch is probably too deep. You really want those a quarter or an eighth, and that's why broadcasting is such a good way to plant that. And the same way with brassicas, really a half inch is about as deep as you want to go on those. And you can go as sh as shallow as an eighth. So we tend to err towards more of the side of caution on that and just broadcast those as well. You may have to roll them in. You may not. Depends on what kind of plant you're doing, whether you did uh, disc or till your, your food plot beforehand before planting, or whether you just sprayed, whether you did a summer cover crop with something like a buckwheat. But read the label on the package. It's going to tell you how deep that seed needs to be planted. And do not exceed that. That's that's the biggest thing I can say. Um, and with corn and beans, again, that's going to vary. Corn is a lot more picky when it comes to how deep it is, and it needs to be consistently the same depth, or you're not going to have a good stand. Beans, like I said before, they can be a little bit more inconsistent on the depth, but you're still going to want them down in the soil. So that's important, really important. And honestly, those are the three big things that you have to do, no matter what you're planning, to have a successful plot. Again, that's whether you're planting something in the spring, the fall, grains, any kind of green food source. You got to make sure you do those things and do them all properly depending on what you're planting. And then on top of all that that goes over all of this is going to be the timing. Obviously, that's another way you can read the label and it's going to give you an idea. A lot of times in the spring, your spring blends are going to want to be planted from March 15th or April 15th to May 15th, somewhere in that window. Obviously, you can stretch that either way, either side of that to get the rain you need. And it depends on the year. If it's getting warmer earlier, you may want to plant them a little earlier. If it's still really cold in April, you might wait because you don't want those to get frost on them and kill them out right after you get them planted. So timing is big too. And again, in the fall, making sure you get those in when they're going to get rain. You don't want to do it too early where they're not going to get rain. You don't want to do it too late where the frost is going to hit them there and kill them as well. So Timing is huge when it comes to planting anything, and that really has to do as much with the weather as it does the calendar again, so make sure you pay attention to that. Now, on to the switchgrass. It's going to be similar. Um, again, you're going to want to read your label to make sure not only when they recommend to plant it, uh, a lot of that's going to depend on what you're planting into, so if you've got a good seed bed prepared from the year before where you've had some chemical on it, then you can frost seed that stuff. Obviously, we're past that point now in most parts of the country, probably even getting past that point up north, unless you get farther north than maybe Iowa, and then I assume you guys can still frost seed up there. You might have snow on the ground still, so you got to pay attention to that on the label. But the biggest thing with switchgrass, and this is with a lot of seed yet, but especially your switchgrass, is you're going to want to make sure it's got good germination rate. And by that, I mean 85% or better on your germination rate. That way, you know you're getting the most for your money. You're not getting something that is 10 pounds of seed, but only 45% of it is germinating. Then you've got five and a half pounds of fluff in the bag that's not doing anything for you. Um, and it can seem expensive when you pay for that seed. If you're getting something that at least that eight and a half pounds of that 10 pounds is germinating, though, obviously your dollar's going a lot farther. Timing again on switchgrass is key to this too, especially for your preparation. Um, 
the biggest thing I'm going to say for planting a new stand of switchgrass is chemical control of your weeds and other grasses. A simazine is a good way to do that. We're kind of too late for that here where we're at, but again, you guys up north, if it hasn't started spring green up yet, you can spray simazine at about three quarts an acre just by itself, and that's going to give you a really good control on your weeds to start with, and it's going to be a really essential step to this. Now, that's not to say right now where we're just after getting into spring green up, you can't still have a successful switchgrass stand. It's just going to be a little more effort, a little more time, a little more chemical, especially if you're planting into something that hasn't been chemically controlled from the last year. That's where you're going to want to go in and do your burn down with 2,4-D and Roundup. 2,4-D is going to be around two quarts an acre Roundup. I'm sorry. Roundup is going to be around two quarts an acre, and then your 2,4-D is going to be about a pint an acre. And you're probably going to have to do that a couple times if it's in a spot that, again, hasn't been chemically controlled in the past. And this is, this is to get rid of the weeds that are there, that are already green and coming up. And then you can broadcast straight into that. So with switchgrass, it's like... Uh, those other seeds I was talking about, the clovers and the brassicas, as long as you have good seed to soil contact, you're going to be in good shape, especially if you can plant it before rain. Let the rain do the work getting that stuff planted. And you're going to want to plant it about eight pounds to the acre. Again, if you go in there and you spray that stuff and you've got good seed to soil contact, you can pr plant it about eight pounds an acre before rain, and you're going to have good luck with that germination. A lot of times, switchgrass can take a while to germinate. So, you got to have some patience with it. Don't think that because a week after you planted it or two weeks after you planted it, you're not seeing anything green that it isn't working. You're going to have to have some patience with it, especially depending on the type of grass you're planting or the type of soil you're planting into. That's going to vary depending on those things as well. So, And that also might give you some time to spray again. So you can spray 2,4-D and Roundup. You can spray 2,4-D really at any time because it's not going to kill that grass. But you can even spray Roundup after you've planted as long as your seed hasn't come through the soil yet. Because Roundup's a contact killer. So let's say you sprayed it twice and you still got some stuff coming up that you know is not your switchgrass. You can go in with Roundup and spray it. As long as your switchgrass hasn't come through the soil yet, you're going to be in good shape. You're not going to kill that. You're going to kill everything else. And then after that, after the spraying, after the planting, mowing is really important in the first year especially and even the second year to having a good stand of switchgrass. That's going to take care of some of your weeds that are going to come up after your spraying of 2,4-D. Uh, more of your warm weather weeds that are going to be there in the summertime. And it's going to set back some of the grasses as well and let your switchgrass get to going. Now, the timing on that is going to, again, vary depending on where you're at in the country and what your weather's like. So it might be a May-June time frame. It might be a June-July time frame. Farther north, you're going to be towards the end of that. Farther south, you're going to be more towards the beginning of that. And it's also going to depend on how much rain you had in the spring as to where your switchgrass is at and, and what growing stage it's at. So a lot of times you're not going to really want to mow it until it gets up around four inches at least where you can mow it and mow over the top of it at that four inch mark. I like to say, you know, if you're going to mow, mow it in May, if it's up to four inches, you can mow it. If you're going to mow it in that June, July, let it get up to about six inches and then mow. And you're going to mow everything at the same height. And that's going to kill those weeds that are in there that have grown up that are going to be your summer weeds. And then it's right before your switchgrass is really going to start to flourish. So it's going to outgrow any of the other competition in there. At least that's the idea if you do it correctly. So you have to time that mowing correctly and you have to do it. We've had stands of switchgrass that we planted um, that haven't been taken care of. And it looks really bad when the fall rolls around. We've had stands of switchgrass that we've planted and have been taken care of. And it looks really good. Even by that first fall, you're going to have a decent stand. And then the next year, you're just going to see even more growth. That's another thing with switchgrass and patience is it's not going to reach full maturity until probably the second or third year. So if you don't see a, a six-foot stand, a five-foot stand of switchgrass in the first or second year you planted it, just keep going through the steps, keep making sure you're mowing it for those first two or three years, and then by that third year you should start to see a good stand of switchgrass, especially if it's not too thick where you're going to have too much too much out there that's going to that's gonna blow over like we did uh, last year with our Antler King mix there at Jeff's. I think we got a little too thick, so it didn't grow as stout and as sturdy. It didn't have enough room. And you don't want to plant it too thin as well because then you're going to have too much room for competition to come up. But as long as you do that eight pounds per acre, you're going to be in a good spot for that. You keep mowing like you're supposed to at the right times. By that third, fourth year, you're going to have a good stand of switchgrass. And as long as you keep taking care of it, you can start to put it on a burn rotation after that every three years. Uh, you still can mow it. There's nothing that says you have to burn it, but that's what a lot of guys prefer to do. It does get rid of a lot more of that litter, um, the stuff that has died and laid down. and allows for more new growth and regrowth from the previous year. 
But if you do all that stuff, again, on a rotation after those first few years, you can have a switchgrass stand that's going to last you 20-plus years. And then, again, when you start talking about cost, if you think about it, you're not having to do a lot of fertilizing, if any. It is going to cost about the same as your food plot seed, maybe a little more, but you're doing that stuff every year, whereas your switchgrass, it's, it may be a lot of upfront cost, but if that lasts you 20 years, you start doing the math on that, it's really a pretty cost-effective way to create screening uh, travel corridors, things like that for whitetails. So those are some tips. Hopefully that helps answer some questions about what you can do to have a successful stand of switchgrass and a successful food plot for either this spring or this fall. Don't forget those three keys that you got to have no matter what you're planning. Thanks guys for tuning in to this Full Draw Friday, episode number 21. I've been saying we'll catch you guys again next week or next Friday, but hopefully you're listening to the Monday episodes as well. We're going to have a really good one coming out Monday with Rodney Hawkins on. And the next week after that will be Austin Stone. We had Steve Shirk on this past Monday. So hopefully we'll he- we'll catch you guys again this Monday for that episode. So again, thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure you're, you're staying tuned for the Monday episode as well.